Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter. I am a last minute substitution. Unfortunately, one of the other speakers got sick. And this is a talk called Go plus microservices equals GoKit, or Applied GoKit would be another way to think about it. Uh, this talk was originally an hour or a bit more, so I've had to kind of compress it. Uh, please forgive me if I go over. It might happen, but I think it's a coffee break afterwards, so hopefully it's not the end of the world. Um, OK, so uh, this talk is about GoKit, which is a, an open source project that I started almost two years ago now, and it's um, about microservices. But before we get started, uh, let me give you sort of the outline of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, number one, microservices, what even is that? Uh, number two, uh, the answer to that is that they're terrible. And then number three is that uh, GoKit makes them less terrible, but only just. And this is kind of the, the flow we'll be, we'll be going through today. OK, uh, first of all, uh, microservices, hang on. What, what is this? And uh, it turns out that like, if you say the word microservices to a room of 100 people, uh, the, the image that is conjured in their minds is there, there's like 30 different ideas that can come up. So I want to take a few minutes to establish kind of a shared context. And I think a good way to do that is to start with a definition. So, a lot of people say, what is a microservice? Well, is it something that's less than 1,000 lines, or is it something that gets deployed in a Docker container, or maybe it's something that's written in Node? And I think none of these really are good definitions. Um, what I want to do is try to build, or at least approach, some kind of good definition, some kind of shared context. And to do that, I want to start talking about a microservice from different angles. Uh, one angle could be from the angle of size, which I think is OK. Um, I think a, a good way to think about a microservice is something that a single programmer can design, implement, deploy, and maintain. This is from a fellow by the name of Fred George. Uh, another one that I like a lot uh, from Dan North, who's this consultant, he says, a microservice is software that fits in your head. Makes sense to me. Uh, from the perspective of data, we can start going a bit more into uh, the design space, and we can say a microservice is something that implements a single bounded context. Does anyone know what a bounded context is? It's this domain-driven design principle. Yeah, there's a lot of, like, um, frankly, BS kind of wrapped up into DDD, but there's also a lot of really good stuff in there, so research that if you haven't. Um, Chris Richardson says uh, a microservice is something that has a single logical database per service, and I think that's also an important distinction. If you move into the lens, the view of operations, another way to look at it, uh, it's through the lens of, of like 12-factor applications. Have we all heard of this as well? Yeah? 12-factor is great. Uh, it de uh, describes 12 things that your software should be. Uh, a couple of them uh, are that it's built and deployed independently. That is, a microservice is sort of independent from other things operationally, and that it's stateless, and it models state as backing services. Um, so here I mean things like DynamoDB was, would be where you store your state, for example. So this is a good way to look at it operationally. Um, Chris Richardson again says, uh, microservices tend to be addressable through a service discovery system. Okay, maybe that makes sense too. So we're kind of approaching from different angles a single idea of what a microservice could be. And I think that idea, and, and maybe the most common idea is um, from the perspective of architecture, it's, it's this thing where you have a monolith and you're breaking it apart into smaller pieces, right? And I think we've all read a thousand articles that have gone through this process before. Um, typically when you do that, you model uh, the things you build as RPC, um, often over HTTP, so all the communication is RPC. Um, you tend to be building something that is kind of cruddy, crud oriented. That means the things you're, you're doing are manipulating domain models, uh, creating, uh, updating, and deleting them most often. And it's built on the, what I'm going to call the request processing pattern. That is, it's something that's sitting there kind of idle um, on microservices, and it's taking requests in, it's doing stuff, and it's returning a response. So you want to do something as quickly as possible, and it's always like request scoped. Um, this is what I'm talking about today. And here are some technologies you often use to implement these things. Ruby on Rails, often. Um, in the Java world, raw Tomcat or Jetty are often Spring Boot is like a, the preeminent microservice framework in that world. If you're doing Scala, you might do Akka Play. There's this other thing that some people talk about when they talk about microservices. It's subtly different. It's sort of stream-oriented. Um, it abides this event sourcing pattern. It's this thing where you have a, like the Twitter hose or something, and you're taking messages off, and you're doing things with them, and then you're providing business value. But the, the thing is, you're not dealing with a request response pattern so much as you're dealing with this like stream of data. 
uh, a message processing pattern, and then you're building value on top of that. And here are the technologies are like SQS or Kinesis or Rabbit or Kafka or something like this. This is another architecture which is incredibly interesting, but it's not what I'm talking about today. So if this is what you think about when you think about microservices, put that to the side for the time being. Uh, as a coda, there's a really interesting article about a week ago by Camille Fournier, I'm sure I'm butchering her name, um, describing this difference that you should look up. Okay, uh, so that's kind of what I'm talking about, and I wanna make one important point. If you take anything away from this talk, it is the following slide, drum roll. Microservices solve problems of organization, but they cause technical problems, invariably. They solve some technical problems, but they create way more. So if you need to solve uh, the problems that I'll illustrate in uh, a slide here, then consider microservices. But if you think it's gonna be a panacea that it's gonna solve issues, technical issues that you're having with your infrastructure, you're badly mistaken, uh, you're setting yourself up for failure. Here's what they solve. Here's what microservices help you with. Uh, my team is too large to work effectively on a shared code base. And I mean just like merging commits, right? If you can split that up into microservices that have a single domain of responsibility, cool. Um, my team is blocked on other teams and I can't make progress. This is something that happens all the time, especially when uh, your teams get too segmented or when you cut your uh, domains of responsibility on the wrong axes or something. Uh, communication overhead in my organization is so big that I, uh, the amount of time I'm, I'm actually producing business value is, is so small that I can't make forward progress and maybe my product velocity is stalled as a result. Microservices solve these things. This is why you should move to this architecture. But here are the problems that they cause. <laughs> Suddenly I need very well-defined business domains so that I can build stable APIs. And if you're still figuring out what your business domain is, this is pretty hard to do. Suddenly I don't have a shared DB anymore, which means if I have to do things with multiple entities and multiple databases, then suddenly I have distributed transactions. And if you don't know how bad this is, Google that and you'll see white papers and terrible things. You don't wanna get these if you can avoid them. Uh, testing becomes really hard and I really should have made this bullet point maybe number one because actually nobody knows how to test a microservice architecture. And like if anyone tells you they do, they're lying because we haven't figured it out yet. There's no concept of the thing you deploy that you can like test in a black box, right? It's, it's like you're deploying every version of everything all the time. There's no static nature of this beast. So it's actually re beyond really hard, I would maybe even say impossible. Uh, it requires this DevOps culture. It requires the people in your organization to have a completely different mindset about how they uh, build software to be run by them and to be paged by them. And if this isn't already built into your engineers, then it needs to be. And if it's not, you're going to have problems. You need this idea of scheduling, uh, service scheduling, job scheduling. You can do this manually for a while, but then if you grow your team to 50 engineers, that breaks down very quickly. You need some idea of addressability, so service discovery system, that can be DNS or it can be something much more complex. You need monitoring and instrumentation. Uh, tailing logs doesn't cut it anymore. New Relic definitely doesn't cut it anymore, so you need Prometheus or you need uh, um, a more sophisticated thing uh, on top of that, perhaps. Uh, you need distributed tracing, maybe? which we'll get up to in the end. Um, you need to worry about build pipelines, continuous integration, continuous deployment. Oh yeah, there's this thing called security. How do I do that? Uh, there's so many things here that we have to worry about. Um, and I'm really just scraping the surface. Uh, my, my former colleague, Sean Treadway at SoundCloud gave a talk recently in Berlin where he looked at um, a given microservice in SoundCloud and said, what do I have to care about with this thing? There's obviously the code on the page, but then what other stuff do I have to care about in order to get this thing responsibly into production? I'm really curious, how many things do you think there are surrounding a single microservice? Just give me an, a, a guess, a number. Yeah, so there's at least 10 things here, right? So 10 more, 12? Any other guesses? 40? 40? Well, you probably saw these slides before. He counted 40 things. Wow. Yeah, it was a good guess. Um, I won't go through them all, but just to, like a few things like how to reporting, how to, what the database model is, how to do caching, uh, what the backup and restore process is, secret management, secret rotation, what the on-call schedule is, what the programming language is, what the CI pipeline is, how do you do integration tests, how do you document the API? Like, these are so many things. And Previously, in your monolith uh, model, you had to do 40 things for one entity, right? So you could kind of hack that up. But in a microservice model, you have to do 40 things for 50 services and you know, like do the multiplication. You need patterns for this. You need to think about ways to do this responsibly, effectively, efficiently, blah, 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 from one to many. So this is hard. 
Uh, in summary, think twice. You probably don't need microservices. And if you're less than five engineers-ish, you definitely don't need microservices. Building an AMI for an EC2 autoscaling group works really, really, really well. Um, and if you don't need to jump into this pile of junk, then don't, really don't. Okay, but maybe you're big enough that you have these organizational problems. Maybe you are convinced that microservices are a good idea. Cool, okay, that brings us to Go kit and Go. Now, normally when I give this talk, I have to kind of pitch Go as an implementation language. I, I guess I don't really have to do that here, so we can skip a lot of stuff. Um, I'll just go right to Go kit. Um, here's the idea. Uh, Go kit is my attempt to make these problems that I've just described tractable. Um, it should make Go attractive in your organization, especially to um, people who are a bit like wary about the idea of introducing a new language, perhaps. And importantly, GoKit should play nice with others. That means playing nice with your infrastructure, playing nice with uh, other language ecosystems running in the same, uh, in the same domain space. Uh, we don't wanna enforce uh, opinions that we don't need to enforce. Importantly, GoKit is not a framework. Um, at least I don't think of it as one. So it's not like Revel or Bigo or Kite or Micro or H2 or Go Circuit. Does anybody remember Go Circuit? This was like one of the original Go uh, things back in the, like, the very first days. Cool, cool stuff. But it had a lot of opinions. So we're not like that. We're a lot more like Gorilla in the sense that we let you kind of pick and choose what you need um, with this idea of progressive enhancements. You can start with a very simple, naive kind of like HTTP uh, uh, microservice and you can add in logging and you can add in maybe at some point the endpoint abstraction and get some value out of that over time. So this is what I hope people will think about, uh, how they think about Go, uh, GoKit. Uh, comparisons, you can compare it to uh, Finagle, which is sort of like the original inspiration in Scala. This Netflix has this whole open source stack of like individual things, very similar goals there. Uh, in Java, Spring Boot has very similar goals, but GoKit is kind of uh, scoped a bit smaller. Uh, in Python, there's this thing called Namiko. Has anyone heard of Namiko before or used it? No, zero people. So like I search for like, like microservice framework and then language and I find new things. And I found this and it looked like it had a community but I've never seen anyone use it before. Is, are there any other things like this that anybody knows about? Like am I, I'm on, honestly curious. No, maybe find me after. I, I, I wanna find out more about this. Um, General philosophy, GoKit encourages you to write your programs with, importantly, no global state at all, zero. Um, this idea of declarative composition, which I'll explore in a bit. Very explicit dependencies, and with interfaces as contracts. And what I'm trying to do is sort of push us all towards these pretty well-established practices of software engineering, which is solid design, as we learned about a few moments ago, uh, domain-driven design, or at least the good parts, the clean architecture, which is an interesting uh, way of structuring programs. I just wanna like, suggest that these are good ways to think about software design and maybe we can, uh, we can like asymptotically approach uh, a, a, good, a good way of thought. So how does it taste? That's, that was the pitch. Let's see how it looks like in practice. And let me check my time here. Cool, okay. So um, let's build sort of a prototypical microservice. And for the purposes of demonstration, it'll be kind of uh, small and silly. Let's say we have some service, and because we're Go programmers, we're gonna model this start service with an interface. So we have this profile service. Uh, profile service has two methods. Of course, it would have many more in practice. Uh, you'll post profile, and you'll get a profile based on an ID. And here's a profile, it's just some plain old data struct. Okay, so um, let's start with a naive implementation without GoKit at all. How might you implement this? You might have a profile service implementation that holds the profiles in memory and just a map, okay, easy enough. And then you might have these two methods, uh, post profile and get profile in order to implement the interface. And they just do exactly what you think. There's some error checking in there. Um, okay, that's cool. That's like the implementation. Now we have to make it callable, right? We have to make it available on the network somehow so that other people can talk to it. And so this is the transport. How do we expose this to other callers? So uh, an obvious way might be to divine a survey HTTP method on the profile service object, which turns it into an HTTP handler. And here's how that might look. Um, very naive again, we just switch on the method. If it's post, we assume it's post profile. And then we JSON decode the body. Uh, if that fails, we return an error. We attempt to um, invoke the post profile method. If that fails, we return an error. Otherwise, fine. And it's exactly the same for get, except you're decoding this like ID uh, form value. 
okay, uh, you can wire it all together. You can you construct your um, your profile service very declaratively. Uh, there's no constructor here because it's a little demo. And then you just listen and serve on it. I could click run, but I hope you can understand this is going to work and do what you expect. Uh, okay, so hooray! Like that. That's it. That's our that's our basic microservice. So cool. That accomplishes our business goals. But now we have to consider all these things that I've uh, started to enumerate. There's 40 things, right? And uh, let's start simple. Uh, we need to have logging in this service, which we didn't do at all. So how might you do that initially? Well, um, okay, naively, I would just stick some log messages in the this, in this serve HTTP uh, handler here. And maybe I want to log every time there's a particular error. So I, I do a log here. And then in this other error case, I do a different log. And down at the bottom, I log success. And you know the same thing for the get method. This is a naive thing. I'm sure you can immediately think of a smarter way to do logging. But the point is, this is one way, kind of like, immediate way you might add this functionality in. OK, so now uh, I, I, I can do a, a log statement here when I boot up. And then when I run it this way, I'll see the messages. I'll see the requests as they come in. Cool. OK, that's one thing kind of ticked off the box. But now let's think about instrumentation, right? So you're a smart group of people. You're probably running Prometheus in your organization. So what we want to do is now have um, a, uh, we want to instrument our code so that when things come in, we can kind of trace them over time and we can build alerts and this sort of thing. So one thing we might have is this histogram or Prometheus summary that tracks the average, uh, the, the ongoing uh, duration of the HTTP request. So we construct this object in the global scope, let's say. Uh, we give it all this information. And then when we invoke our HTTP handler, we take a mark of the time at the, at the top and then whenever we exit, we have to observe, we have to record how long it took. So this is kind of like basic instrumenting 101. If you want to learn more about this, Bjorn has a talk, I believe, at the end of today about how to instrument your Go code. Uh, check that one out. That's a good one. Uh, so OK, it's the same idea, though. Like We just sprinkle our code with these little statements that accomplish our goal. Uh, same thing here in the get. We have to do it a couple of times because there's a couple of exit points. And again, you can think of smarter ways to do this, but OK, this is what it kind of looks like. And what we have now is that our business logic, which is, uh, remember, the post profile and the get profile functions, they're kind of fine. They're kind of pure. But our transport code is full of all these mixed concerns, right? And I've highlighted them here. All this stuff has nothing to do with HTTP, right? It has to do with instrumenting and logging. And we've just covered like two things, right? There's 40 more things. So what I'd like to do is have an idea of separating concerns. And this is the, like the solid principle. Um, it's, it's like S, like single responsibility principle, right? We want to somehow separate all this stuff. And at the core, we have our business logic in the middle. And then we want to build kind of what, what I'm arguing here is like layers of abstraction uh, to give each piece of code a single thing to do. And if we can wire this together somehow, that would be great. So this brings us to the idea of middleware, which I'm sure we've all seen before. And this is how GoKit chooses to implement uh, this uh, design goal. And um, it would be great. The, the motivation here, it would be great if we had some kind of single purpose composable middleware where we could have something that did the business logic and then something that wrapped it that did um, the logging, something that wrapped it and did instrumenting only, all the way down to like other stuff that might be interesting, like rate limiting or, or circuit breaking or something like this. So in order to do this, we introduce an abstraction, a generalization called an endpoint. We can generalize each operation, post profile, get profile, as an RPC. And an RPC is something that takes a request and returns a response. Remember, this is the architecture that we're talking about. It's not, it's not stream processing. It's like request response style message, message model. So we can model RPC methods as endpoints. Um, this first thing is like the simplified version. But there's a couple other things it turns out we need to care about. We have this lovely context thing. So uh, we need to wire a, a, a context in at the beginning. Just take that on faith for the time being. And then also, things can fail, so we need to return an error. And then we get this thing at the bottom here, uh, which is actually what an endpoint looks like in GoKit. Um, yeah, empty interface, yeah, um, sucks. I wish I didn't have to do that. But onward, ever onward. Um, the way we get endpoints is we construct them. And uh, here's what an endpoint constructor would look like for us. There's a couple ways to do it. We've chosen to go this way. Uh, 
we have this constructor make post profile endpoint. It takes a profile service and it returns an endpoint. So we just do this very rote kind of translation. Um, it's a little tedious, I totally grant that, but it abides the single responsibility principle. All this code does is convert from a request type into the post profile method, like the go domain, and then convert the response back. Similarly, the, uh, the get profile endpoint. So by doing this, we keep the profile service pure and we avoid mixing in these endpoint concerns to the business logic. Um, we now have a general form for our operations and we can layer in value-added stuff without kind of knowing or caring about the underlying logic. So here we can define a middleware type, which is a function that takes an endpoint and returns an endpoint. And this, I believe, could be interpreted as the Liskov substitution principle in, in, in some sense. The point is that it's still an endpoint. It's still doing what you want it to do. It takes a request, returns a response, but inside it has additional behavior. It's also known as the decorator pattern. Okay, so perhaps the simplest middleware is one that just logs the call. So here we have a function that takes an endpoint, returns an endpoint. Uh, that endpoint is something that takes the time. Um, defers a, uh, a log.print statement, and then calls the underlying the next endpoint. Uh, so we have a single thing that it's doing here. Uh, what we don't have is an understanding of which method is actually being called. So the log statement says request took whatever. We want to know maybe post request took or get request took. So we need to provide more information. And one way to do that is to add another kind of wrapping layer. And this is the maximum you ever need. What we're doing here is, is having a logging middleware constructor that closes over some state, and in this case, the state is the method that's being called, and it returns a middleware type. A middleware is a function that takes an endpoint and returns an endpoint, and the endpoint is this function signature, and then we have all the information we need. So it's just kind of three stack. You see that sometimes. That's how it's defined. Now we can log the method and how long it took, and here's how you wire it in at the bottom. Um, you construct your endpoint, and then you build these layers of the onion, right? At the core, it's the business logic, and then you wrap it with logging, and then you wrap it with instrumenting, each of these things only doing one thing at a time. So middlewares are great. Uh, each middleware is exclusively concerned with a single task. We can avoid mixing in different concerns, keeping each piece of functionality pure. And this makes our code kind of nicer, to ease, uh, nicer and easier to maintain, refactor, eventually delete, perhaps. So there's other endpoint middlewares. You can imagine you can implement a circuit breaker. I won't get into the details due to time. Rate limiter, the whole point is that they operate on the same abstract concept, an endpoint, the request response lifecycle. That's the endpoint. But remember, we also have the service interface, right? We have this thing, the profile service, which is an interface which permits additional implementations. So we can construct this thing called a service middleware, which is very similar. It's a, uh, something that takes a profile service and returns a profile service. We have to do this because uh, GoKit can't do this because the profile service is our business domain, right? But if we define this, then that means we can use the same pattern to accomplish very similar goals, except with access to our business domain functions, methods, objects, this sort of thing. So, um, let's say in our profile service, we want to know whenever any Michaels register because our, our, our team leads are silly. So we can build this alerting middleware and uh, it can embed a profile service and it can have this other uh, dependency called an alerter. Who knows what that is? We only care about registration, so we only have to override this one post profile method and in there, we just check if the incoming profile has a name that contains Michael, and if so, we send this alert, and then otherwise we just push everything through. That's the only thing we need to implement because by, be, by embedding the profile service, we automatically uh, lift all of the methods to the uh, alerting middleware unadulterated. And so with this, we can kind of wire it in in exactly the same way. We construct our profile service. We, at the innermost layer of the onion, it's just the core business logic. Then we wrap this alerting middleware around it. And you can keep doing this for more things that you want to do. And in the end, you get something that accomplishes exactly what you want uh, with these clean lines of separation. And uh, it's just another layer in the stack where you can, you can put things in, basically. OK. So far, that's the endpoint abstraction, that's the service abstraction, but we, what we haven't talked about yet is the transport. And so you can imagine HTTP is probably what most of you are using, but that's not really the only way you can expose something to the world, right? We have this thing called gRPC, which is really nice. We have Thrift, we have Avro, we have NetRPC. There's lots of ways that your organization might decide that it wants 
services to talk to each other. And GoKit honestly shouldn't have an opinion about this, right? You know best. GoKit is just there to help you um, get Go into the organization. Uh, it's, it's there to help you, yeah. Uh, we're not gonna try to enforce any ideas here. So um, we wanna allow you to bind to transports uh, however you want. One often way you do that is with HTTP. And so GoKit comes with a handy HTTP transport. Uh, it allows you to do kind of cruddy style, resty style, plain RPC style, whatever you want. All you have to do is pass it an endpoint and then a way to decode the request and encode the response. And these are just functions. They take an HTTP request and a response writer and blah, blah, blah. Um, and this is how it looks. You have this post profile thing which um, HTTP transport new server is a function we provide. You give it all this stuff and then it gives you an HTTP handler. So it allows you to expose this endpoint to the outside world. Uh, here's how you'd use it with Gorilla Muxer. You'd create a new router, you do a method post handler, that thing, and then you're basically done. Um, now, let's look at, take a step back, look at all the middlewares that we could have wired in here. This is what a, a larger program might look like. You create the post endpoint. Um, you build the innermost layer based on the service. You wrap it with rate limiters and circuit breakers and logging and instrumentation, and then you finally, at the end, you wrap it with the transport ex uh, uh, adapter for HTTP. Um, a similar stack for the other endpoint. You put that into the MUX router and then you listen and serve. And isn't this nice? There's no magic here, right? We're just going line by line and we're saying, my service is this, and then I have this concern, and then I have this concern, and then at the end, I'm exposing over HTTP. And look at this, like, post endpoint is just the thing which implements all the business logic, including all of like the safety stuff. But you can also pass that to a gRPC uh, uh, server as well. And you can have the exact same service with the exact same business logic exposed on multiple transports, so on multiple ports, potentially. This is a great way if you're transitioning from HTTP to gRPC or Thrift or something for per performance reasons in your org, you can do this kind of this nice little transition. Anyway, I just think it's, uh, think it's neat. So it's all very declarative, and that's what I meant when I said declarative composition. You just see exactly bang, bang, bang. This is what my service is doing. Uh, there's, there's no magic, and I really like that. Here's a list of supported transports, um, shared middleware stacks, just different serialization. Uh, so now, like, I admit this is quite a lot of boilerplate. Why bother doing all this? Um, just to reiterate from the beginning, you kind of know best. You've already built uh, some culture around a certain way of doing things. Um, and by culture, I don't just mean in the hearts and minds of your developers, but also tooling, reporting, um, uh, instrumentation around all these things. And I don't think that I can really impose my opinion on that stuff. I think you probably have done this for a good reason. There's a lot of institutional memory and institutional uh, uh, momentum behind these decisions. So I don't wanna like disrupt that. I wanna make it easy to adopt Go, play nicely in your infrastructure. And it doesn't just hold for this stuff, it's all of the stuff that microservices touch, service discovery, logging infrastructure, orchestration, configuration. I try to be hands off, opinion free. Okay, I wanna have a coda. Um, how much time do I have? Like five minutes, I guess, right? Something like that? Three? Okay. Uh, all my slides are online, so if I don't get to something, you can find out for yourself. Uh, so distributed tracing is this idea, have anyone heard of Zipkin? Yeah, so if you have a bunch of services and a request comes in and it talks to the service and that service and then it comes back and then maybe talks to some more and then comes back, you wanna be able to visualize this and distributed tracing is the way typically you visualize it. It involves passing information between services in a way that the services don't really care about but they need to propagate. Um, this is one way to visualize it. This is what a Zipkin um, UI looked like some time ago. I really wish they used flame charts. I find that much more intuitive, but maybe someone will do that at some point. So think about how you would have to do, the, what you would need to do to get this to work in your current services, right? You'd have to say, okay, well, if I see a request header uh, in the HTTP transport, I need to propagate it into my dom business domain, and then I need to figure out a way to annotate it with the right information, and then propagate it back out to all the dependencies I call and I need to pass that information through all these things that I've written. But I mean, that's really hard, and especially to do it over all of your services, it's really hard. So using this GoKit middleware, single responsibility kind of idiom, it's, I hope, a little bit easier. We have this helper that moves these IDs from the HTTP header into this context object, right? So moving it from the transport domain into the business domain. And then we have other middlewares that help to create 
these objects that you annotate with more information, pass them through um, on the on the on the uh, to your dependencies, collect the responses, annotate more, and then eventually ship them off to the collector. Uh, it's as light touch as it can possibly be. And so in order to put Zipkin support, for example, into a GoKit service, you really just have to stick one little uh, middleware in your middleware stack and also uh, one more in the transport stack that I'm not showing you here. But that's it, right? Can you imagine trying to do that without these helpers? You'd have to touch so many points in the code. And this, I think, is the, the greatest like value proposition of GoKit, that to do this really complex stuff that you need to do once you get big enough, it's the least amount of effort, and it composes very nicely with your other, your other domains of responsibility. OK, so very quickly, uh, a look back. Microservices are a pain in the ass. They cause a lot of problems. You probably don't need them. Uh, but if you do, fine. Um, GoKit at least makes them a little bit tractable. Uh, we have very few opinions lightly held. Uh, we provide solution to common problems. Middlewares is the idiom. Uh, we have adapters for all the common infrastructure stuff, um, console, Zookeeper, etcd, uh, all the logging frameworks, all the metrics and instrumentation systems. It's kind of plug and play, common interfaces, that sort of thing. And the community is great. We make very slow and steady progress. We're not like flash in the pan. We're making uh, sustainable commits, regular releases. Um, we have like 50 contributors. It's hopefully a very trustable project. So I hope that in time, uh, if you need this stuff, you will uh, look at GoKit, and, and hopefully it will help you adopt Go in your org if that's what you're doing. Thanks very much.